Thank you, Harrison. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay up the back? Okay, great. Now, the photograph here was taken from Germany in March earlier this year, and it's a photograph of a solar eclipse. Um, and a solar eclipse is where the moon passes between the sun and the earth and uh, partially or fully obscures the sun for a period of time. Now, this solar eclipse, uh, prior to it happening, had the uh, operators of the German electricity grid planning for months as to how they would deal with the solar eclipse. And the reason for that is that Germany has a huge amount of solar power in its grid. It has, the, more than any other country in the world, it has um, 38 gigawatts of solar power. Now, just to put that into perspective, uh, New Zealand has, of any type of generation, hydro, thermal, geothermal, wind, uh, has a total of nine gigawatts of uh, generation installed. So it's less than a quarter the solar in Germany. Uh, now, the, the German, Germany did manage to get through this solar eclipse, but it caused a change in generation from the solar, mainly on people's rooftops, of about 100 megawatts per minute. Now, 100 megawatts, it's the size of a reasonable-sized power station, to give you some perspective on that, uh, Benmore Power Station is 540 megawatts. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to talk about tonight is worldwide PV solar power and PV technology. Move on to talk about PV solar power in New Zealand. And then Shrizan's going to talk to us about PV solar power in Tonga. And from this lecture, as well as learn more about rooftop PV systems, PV meaning photovoltaic, and PV technology. Um, Shrijan and I want to let you know three things. One, just how massive the global PV industry is. Two, the resource and economics for PV in New Zealand. And three, how PV can be used to benefit some nations such as the Pacific Island nations. And we have uh, quite a lot of material to cover. Um, and we, but we plan to leave some time at the end for questions. So starting off with worldwide solar, PV solar power and PV technology. First of all, I'm going to look at uh, a rooftop photovoltaic PV solar system, just to familiarise you with what they look like. Um, look at the, a bit of the history of photovoltaics. Um, talk about the global industry and then a little bit about how it all works. Now, it is appropriate that in 2015 we should be talking about solar power because this is the International Year of the Light. Uh, and there's a number of people who have given me material for this presentation or helped uh, prepare it. And I'd just like to acknowledge those people. Um, Professor Man al um, Dr. Alan Wood, and Bill Heffernan, Dr. Bill Heffernan from the Epicentre, uh, Tim Crownshaw also from the Epicentre, and Scott Lemon and Luke Schwartzberger, who are working with me on PhDs in this area. Now, looking at a rooftop photovoltaic system, um, you, I'm sure you've all seen houses with photovoltaic panels on the roof. It is, it's the predominant form of solar power that we think of. It's the, the predominant form of solar power in Germany. It's mainly rooftop mounted. Um, and a typical solar panel is here. And that's, that's the typical size of a solar panel. Um, this is called a monocrystalline solar panel. It's quite a dark colour as compared to poly polycrystalline, which is more of a shattered glass, bluey sort of look. These are typical of the ones you might see along the roadside out in the country, uh, powering remote devices. Uh, but these are typical of what you see on a roof. Um, and each one of... Th this has 72 solar cells in it. Each one of these squares is a solar cell. And it's actually a silicon junction, a semiconductor junction called a PN junction. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so these produce DC power, direct current power, which is converted to alternating current by an inverter here. And uh, we have an example of an inverter here. It's a, a, a two kilowatt inverter. Um, there's another kind of inverter as well, which is called a micro inverter. And that sits on each panel, um, whereas you'd, you'd need quite a few panels to feed this particular inverter, about 10 panels. 
So the inverter converts the DC from, um, for, uh, to alternating current and enables it to be fed into the grid or supply your home, which is built using alternating current. A smart meter is required to measure how much goes into the grid and, of course, how much your home uses. Now, um, the inverter doesn't just convert DC to AC. It does a number of other things. It does a thing, another thing called maximum power point tracking. Um, and, and that is basically optimizing the energy from the solar panels as the external conditions change, like the sun, sunlight varies, cloud might go over the sun, so it tracks that. Uh, as the temperature changes, the maximum power point of a panel changes, so the inverter needs to match, the, uh, match to that maximum power point. It also does things like uh, protection, uh, and uh, another very important thing is ensure safety of the grid. So, for example, if, if the, there was a fault on the grid out here on the distribution lines, uh, it should, an inverter should isolate the home so that there's no backfeed of electricity. Now, a bit about the history of photovoltaics uh, and the PV cell invention. And it really all started with a French scientist in 1839 uh, called Edmund Becquerel. Uh, he was experimenting with an electrolytic cell and found that it produced more voltage in sunlight than it did in the dark. And that was the first discovery of the photoelectric effect. But it was not documented until 1905 by Albert Einstein uh, in his paper on the photoelectric effect. And actually, he, that's what he won the Nobel Prize for in 1921. Um, it was quite a long time later that the first uh, actual solar cell was built in a laboratory, and that was done in Bell Labs by three engineers. And the photograph here is the three engineers in the laboratory shining a lamp onto their cell and measuring its output voltage. Um, and a few years later, the solar cell packages a panel found application in the satellite technology to, use, to power satellites. And it's really the perfect application of photovoltaics because they're out in space, there's no atmospheric effects from the, from the Earth's atmosphere, no clouds, and they can point directly at the sun continuously. Uh, and it was really uh, the satellite programs and space programs that drove photovoltaics further on. Um, there was a little bit of experimenting in the 1970s with them for power supplies uh, due, as a result of the oil crisis. But it was really the 90s that uh, photovoltaics really started to take off. And in about 1999, there was something like one megawatt installed globally. But that grew extremely rapidly uh, to 2004, where there was 3.7 gigawatts. And this graph shows the increase in installed capacity of photovoltaics uh, across the world to 2014. And by the end of 2014, there was about 177 gigawatts of solar. Um, and again, to put that into context, Germany is 38 gigawatts, so Germany makes up about that much. New Zealand's total installed capacity of any generation source, hydro, wind, geothermal, is 9 gigawatts. So you can see that it's a big industry. And where is that photovoltaic capacity installed around the world? This is a pie chart showing where it's installed, and Europe makes up over half of the photovoltaic capacity. Germany, 27%, the world leader. But Italy deserves a mention. Uh, it's very high in PV capacity. Um, China, Taiwan, and Japan um, together make up about 23%, and that's growing quite rapidly. Um, North America, 11%, and then the rest of the world, 8%. And Australia is actually a, a decent proportion of the rest of the world. But New Zealand is a tiny slice of the rest of the world, and I'll show you a bit more about that soon. Um, so the question is, you know, where are all those panels produced? And this is a graph of uh, annual production, and we measure the production in gigawatts um, versus year, starting in 2000 to 2013. Uh, and you can see predominantly panels were produced in uh, Europe and um, Japan up until about 2008. And it was 2008 that China came into the market and really ramped up production. And this is China ramping up production in PV panels. You can see 
you know, um, by, the, by 2013, they were producing nearly 25 gigawatts of panels each year, and that's just continued to increase. And uh, it, that is the reason why we've seen such a huge decline in the price of PV panels, which has enabled people to consider putting them on their roofs and powering their homes. Um, in the 70s, you would probably pay hundred, hundreds of dollars per watt for a PV panel. Today, I can go and buy a PV panel for about $1.20 a watt, a very good PV panel, maybe even less if I shop around. Now, this is a heat map of the world, and the red areas show areas of really high, uh, what we call irradiation, lots of energy from the sun landing on the surface of the earth. The green and blue areas, not much irradiation, not much power from the sun landing on the, the earth. And obviously, um, well, it's, it, it's areas like Australia, um, North Africa, that are, have excellent irradiation. Um, but New Zealand, I'm just going to go through a few countries. New Zealand has a capacity of about 0 0.03 gigawatts or 30 megawatts of solar at the moment, PV solar. Uh, but actually, to compare countries, we use a benchmark. Uh, we benchmark that figure per head of population. So per person, New Zealand has about 5.6 watts of solar. Australia, on the other hand, has 173 watts per person and a total of over 4 gigawatts. So you know, they, they have a lot of solar, but as you can see, there's very good irradian, irradiation in Australia. Japan and China, uh, 28 gigawatts each. Um, Japan has a, ver a, a very high uh, proportion per person of solar. Um, then the USA, um, a, a large number, uh, 57 watts per person. Other parts of Europe, with a mention, the UK is 80 watts per person and growing very rapidly. Um, Spain, 112 watts per person and um, not moving much. Italy, 302 watts per person. But the world leader, Germany, is 462 watts per person. So just a very quick slide on how the photovoltaic effect works. Uh, and I won't dwell on this. If, if you want to know more about it, I, you can ask a question at the end. And I can come back to the slide or come and see me at the end. But basically, how it works is sunlight and typically in the visible spectrum, so uh, red to blue light, um, hitting a, uh, two semiconductor materials joined together, um, split off an electron from a silicon atom. Um, it, so the sunlight with enough energy splits that atom off, um, and it throws the atom into one of the semiconductor materials and leaves a void, or a thing we call a hole, in the other semiconductor material. Now, because they're semiconductors, the, atom, the, the electron can't get back from the top layer to this other semiconductor layer. It has to actually go through this electrode on the surface, through the electrical load and into the electrode on the back. And you can actually see some of the electrodes on the surface here, the very fine wires. Uh, and they, they're collecting those electrons, putting them through the load and into a, a, a rear metal contact. Uh, now, Obviously, sunlight getting through to the earth uh, has, it can either come directly to a photovoltaic panel, or if it's clouds, <coughs> it can be scattered off the clouds, and we call that diffuse <coughs> radiation, or we could have albedo radiation, which is reflected off the ground. You notice that the panel's on a tilt, and it is actually important to tilt a panel towards the sun to optimise the amount of energy collected. And it's also important to orient it north, or actually slightly west of north, <coughs> um, to you know, get the maximum sun during the day. And I say slightly west of north because of a higher cloud cover in the morning. <coughs> um, this is a graph of daily and annual PV variability. <coughs> um, this is irradi irradiance here, so the power from the sun. It's measured from one of our pyranometers uh, here at the university, starting from summer through to winter through to summer. And you can see there's a very clear seasonal pattern as well. Obviously, the earth is tilting. Um, with essentially, the, the sun is lower angle in the winter here. Uh, there's also a rapid daily variation that you can see here. 
this is a bit of a problem for New Zealand. That, uh, if we want to build a power system on, based on solar and use hydro as well uh, and wind, um, there is actually a coincidence of low solar irradiation with low hydro inflows and low wind. There's actually a, a, a lull in the wind in around about August. Um, now, if we zoom in on that, on one month, it's month of March, you can see very clearly the daily pattern, uh, but you can see too that there can be large variations from one day, the 1st of March, to the next. And that's cloud cover that's causing that. But you can also see, say, in, within a day, there's a large variation as well, and that's cloud cover as well, clouds passing over the, the sun. Um, I'm going to move now on to PV solar power in New Zealand. Uh, I want to look at the rate of uptake in New Zealand. Uh, I mentioned before that we have about 30 megawatts. Well, let's look at how that's, uh, uh, what the uptake rate of that is. Talk a bit about the solar resource in New Zealand, the economics to homeowners and businesses in New Zealand for solar power. Look at some environmental aspects very quickly and then finish by looking at some, uh, an impact on the grid of solar power. Now this is a graph of megawatts versus uh, time. We start in 2009 here and go up to uh, the year, actually the end of August 2015. Um, you can see around about 2012 the uptake really started in New Zealand and uh, became very rapid. Um, we've been collecting this data from distribution companies and since this period the Electricity Authority has started to publish these results. The dotted line here is November last year, and some of you may know that the, some of the electricity companies reduced their buyback rates in November. We wondered if that would slow the uptake down. We think it did a little bit, but then it's taken off again. So I don't think that's going to slow it down. Now, something that's really important when looking at any generation source is this, for electricity is this concept of capacity factor. The capacity factor is really an indication of how the resource and the capacity of a generator can be utilised to produce energy. Um, so it's the ability to turn energy from a resource into useful energy in the electricity grid. Now wind in New Zealand has an excellent capacity factor, 45%. Europe, it's something in the range of 30 to 35%. So we, you know, we have a lot of wind here. Um, geothermal has a, a fantastic capacity factor of 96%. The reason it's 96 and not 100 is simply that they need to take the plants down for maintenance at times. Um, so that geothermal resource is constantly available. So two very good sources of renewable energy for New Zealand. Solar, on the other hand, has a capacity factor, depending on your location, between 13 and 18%. So it's a lot lower than other renewable sources. And the heat map of New Zealand here shows the capacity factor uh, for various centres in New Zealand. You can see Christchurch, it's around 14%, and that's partly because of our latitude as well as cloud cover. Um, but the, the best areas in, in New Zealand are the Nelson-Tasman area at 18%, Marlborough area is not bad at 17%, and then Northland, the whole east coast of the North Island uh, Compar comparatively good areas for solar compared to, say, parts of the South Island like um, Christchurch and the West Coast or Southland. All the same, 13 to 18% is not great. And actually, if you work it out, even if New Zealand got to 100 watts per person, so remember we're currently about 5.6, Germany's 462, Australia's 180, if we got to 100 watts per person, that's about 4,000, uh, 4, 460 megawatts, actually the energy contribution to New Zealand's grid from that would only be about 1 to 1.5%. So it doesn't really do a lot to get us towards that 90% total of uh, renewable generation, our goal uh, of, of renewable generation. I'm going to look now at the economics of solar. Uh, and we did a study uh, earlier this year where we looked at uh, several thousand homes and um, divided their load profiles, which is the, the load versus time of the homes, into 32 different categories depending on certain characteristics of the home, and then analysed the potential returns from solar. And this is a graph of um, kilowatts used by the home versus time of day 
for just one day in April, and you know, we did this for an entire year, um, and you can see this blue line here is the load of the house. The green line is the PV generation for a three and a half kilowatt system. Um, now this particular home, it's actually an, uh, an agglomeration of a number of homes, so uh, we didn't want to use one particular home. It's a, um, a low user, so they're below that 8,000 kilowatt hours per annum threshold. They do actually use electric space heating. They're on night rate and you can see the peak and load at night. Um, they use electric water heating, but importantly, they're away during the day. They have quite a low load during the day. So the solar generation at times is well above the house's load. So any time the solar generation is above the house's load, that energy is being exported to the grid and they're selling the energy, the house is selling the energy for eight cents a kilowatt hour, the buyback rate in New Zealand. Any time it's below the blue line, uh, the house is offsetting their load and they're effectively offsetting their retail rate, variable retail rate, which is about 25 to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's much better if you can use it in your home. Now, another type of house has a very high load. Um, they, they are a high user of electricity. They use electric space heating. Importantly, they are home during the day and they may even have something like a swimming pool that they're heating during the day. <clears throat> Most of the time, the load is above the generation from the PV panels, except for this point here. So most of the time they're offsetting their really high variable retail rate of 25 to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So not surprisingly, our results show that for this kind of home, it, solar power doesn't make sense if you are interested in financial returns only. But the, for this kind of home, yes, it does make sense. And uh, we worked out there's about 4% of these homes in the sample. So just to summarise that, looking at um, residential solar, the returns, we, we've analysed it in terms of a thing called net present value, which is basically taking all of the costs of solar and all of the potential returns in the future over a 20-year time period and translating it to a dollar value in today's terms. So if you spent money on a solar system and put it on your roof, what would it be worth to you in today's terms? Uh, and it's anywhere between minus 3,000 and 3,000. That's for a, a three and a half kilowatt system at uh, $3 per watt. Um, and quite a small number of proportion of homes in this positive area at the moment. Uh, however, the price of panels is reducing, so uh, th there could be an increasing number of homes in this area. We also looked at commercial installations and found that there's a lot more that are negative a uh, very negative NPV, uh, and that's primarily because of the, the large cost of putting solar up, um, but mainly um, due to the lower variable retail rate for electricity that um, uh, commercial premises uh, have. So it could be anything like 15 cents a kilowatt hour. But there are cases where it's positive, and that's mainly because those businesses typically use their energy during the day. So, you know, remember I was showing you before, if you use your energy during the day, you offset your variable retail rate. Then utility scale schemes. We don't have any utility scale schemes in New Zealand. This is a photo of one from Andalusia in Spain. Um, and you can see that the net present value for those in New Zealand is very negative. It's very hard to make them make any financial sense. And the reason for that even though they have a much lower cent per kilowatt hour effective cost of their energy, uh, um, pr price of their energy, um, they sell their energy onto the spot market, which is around about eight cents per kilowatt hour. So it really doesn't make sense for utility scale schemes from our um, research. And if anyone's interested in more information about this, uh, we have the paper with the results on our website and. There's a newsletter here uh, with a brief summary of that paper. Now, the one thing that could change this for homeowners, if you're a low user home and away during the day, is battery storage. And I'm sure you've all heard about the Tesla battery. If it's possible to store this generation and then use it at these times in the evening and the, the morning, rather than selling it to the grid, then you can offset that 25 cent per kilowatt hour retail rate. 
However, you need to make sure that the cost of storage is, is less than the difference between the retail rate, 25 cents a kilowatt hour, and your 8 cents per kilowatt hour buyback rate that you sell it to the grid, or you know, Meridian Energy or an energy company. Um, from our um, analysis so far, we think that the cost of storage is anywhere between 40 cents a kilowatt hour and 60 cents a kilowatt hour on a, a long-term you know, levelised cost of energy from batteries. So they're just not there yet in terms of making it economical, uh, but it does seem the price of cost of batteries is, is coming down. So we might see them being more useful in the future. Um, just move on to environmental uh, aspects of photovoltaic solar. <clears throat> now I've listed a number of different um, technologies for solar here. And monocrystalline, I pointed out before, this is a monocrystalline panel. This is a, a polycrystalline panel. <coughs> now, the production of mono and multicrystalline panels is very energy intensive. <coughs> They're made of silicon, and it's necessary to smelt silicon at about 3,000 degrees. That requires a lot of energy. And if those panels are made in China, China's energy source is primarily coal. So there's a lot of coal burnt to produce PV panels, which in effect means that PV panels from, say, China have a lot of uh, greenhouse gases embodied in them. So it takes a number of years of operation of those panels to basically offset the PV panels that were used to produce them. And depending on where they were produced, a number of things like where they were produced and the power system that they're going into really um, changes the number of years required to pay back those greenhouse gases. If you put them into a power system that's fully or mostly renewable and you're offsetting renewables with the PV panels, then your payback time is going to be a long time. It could be anything like 18 years. It could be up to 18 years. But if you put them into a power system that's powered by coal or diesel, then it would be a lot lower. Now, we believe that in the New Zealand power system at the moment anyway, uh, PV panels uh, will offset um, gas or coal. Uh, they won't offset hydro. Hydro will be used in the process of offsetting gas and coal, um, which is you know, quite, quite a good thing. Um, but depending on where they're manufactured will change the time to pay back those greenhouse gases. So it could be for monocrystalline anywhere between three and seven years. Multicrystalline doesn't take quite as much energy to produce, so it could be between two and four years. There's a new technology here which we call a second generation technology. It's called thin film flexible PV panels, um, which uh, take less energy to build, but they have other environmental uh, issues associated with them. Namely, the main one is built of cadmium, which is uh, highly carcinogenic. So that's a concern in terms of disposal of the panels. Um, and some other issues with um, uh, silicon crystalline is um, production in China. Uh, not only does it create greenhouse gases, but it causes local pollution like acidification, and there's even been cases of uh, companies, factories in China dumping acid into rivers, uh, hydrochloric acid. Now, the other thing I want to talk about just before I hand over to Shreesan is PV's impact on the grid. Now, um, there are actually a, a number of different impacts that it can have on the grid. The one in particular we're looking at in the epicenter as part of the Green Grid project is the, the, um, what happens when PV starts um, pushing power back the other way down the grid, down the power lines. Now, this is a diagram here of a very simplified diagram of uh, a power line, local power line supplying a house. So this would be your 230 volt power line supplying your home. Um, and there could be hundreds of homes, you know, or tens to hundreds of homes on the end of that power line or distributed along it. Um, and this is the grid. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to the grid than just that. Uh, but it's a simplified diagram. Um, and what if these homes had solar panels? Now, at the moment, the, the power flows down the transmission line or the power line to the home, and the voltage profile along that line is such that it falls along the line. And, and that's just basic, that, that, that's physics of how um, voltage changes with power flow. Uh, if, however, the sun shines, the voltage and the power is reversed, which may happen, and we have found cases where that is happening, the voltage profile can be reversed, so it falls the other way, 
And you can end up with a situation where the voltage at the end of the line can be above this dotted line, which is a statutory limit. There is a statutory limit for voltage in New Zealand at 6% above the 230. And if that happens, it, um, well, not only is it um, an, an illegal situation, uh, but it, the, the reason for the statute is that um, uh, you know, too high a voltage can stress equipment and cause equipment failures. Uh, so it, it's a great concern to distribution companies to make sure that you know, the voltage does not rise above the statutory limit. We've done a lot of modelling in the epicentre, and my student, Scott, has done all of this modelling. Um, this is a, a map of Orion's network in Christchurch, and we've done this similar modelling for other networks. Um, it, it shows areas in red that could potentially have voltage rise issues above the statutory limit if there's a, very, if there's a high enough concentration of photovoltaics. The areas in blue are not such of an issue. And we can actually turn this into a concept, or a, a thing we call hosting capacity, which is the ability of each home in a network to host uh, solar power. So in other words, how many kilowatts of solar power can that home inject into the grid before it could give rise to power quality issues? Um, and uh, that is something that we've developed at the epicenter and uh, uh, providing to distribution companies to enable them to understand their, the ability of the networks to host solar power. So I've looked at solar power in the world and in New Zealand and now I'm going to hand over to Shrijan to look at solar power in Tonga. Thanks, Alan. Um, so in 2008, a couple of things happened that was quite interesting. You might remember fuel prices went up and we're complaining about um, not being able to afford uh, fuel again. Um, and as Alan showed earlier, China was producing more and more of those uh, solar panels. Um, that had a huge impact. The oil prices that went up globally had a huge impact in the Pacific Islands. Um, the plot on the right uh, shows all of the different islands um, in the region, and the grey bars basically mean that um, electricity that was generated in that country uh, was fueled by diesel. Um, quite a lot of diesel there. Uh, the only countries that have hydro or a little bit of wind um, are countries that have uh, that had water resource available or wind resource, um, but mostly powered by diesel. So fuel prices, certainly in the case of Tonga, sorry, electricity prices in the case of Tonga is made up, made up of fuel component and non-fuel component, and the fuel component currently is about 50% of the overall tariff. So as the price of oil goes up, um, electricity prices go up. Um, for those of you who are not familiar um, with Tonga, New Zealand's over there. Tonga is probably one of our closest um, Pacific Island nations. It's made up of four main groups. Tonga Tapu is the main group. Uh, about 80%, uh, roughly around 80,000 people uh, from Tonga live in that uh, on that island. Um, GDP uh, shows you the economic comparison between New Zealand um, and Tonga. Um, they don't make a lot of money, 6,000 roughly GDP per capita per annum. Uh, but if you look at the power price, 54 cents, that's in New Zealand dollars, um, per unit. We pay 25 cents per unit here. Uh, so that gives you a bit of an uh, appreciation for where things uh, we're at. Um, just before I move on to this slide, we got involved in 2012 um, because schools in Tonga um, were facing closure. A um, few of the schools um, couldn't afford to pay for uh, their staff salaries and they also um, uh, had trouble paying the electricity energy bills. 80% of the overall expense was made up of energy bills. Why? Because uh, you use p electricity to pump water out of the ground uh, and store it up. Uh, that gravity feeds into the um, supplies of, uh, of schools. Uh, and also because uh, I think some of the energy efficiency in schools, like in principal's offices or residences, um, they had air conditioning running with um, windows open, for example. So um, there was a lot of cost associated there. Um, but why solar? Why solar in Tonga? Um, hydro is um, quite, an, quite an attractive option if you've got water or, or height, a hill where water can flow down. They don't have any um, 
hills in Tongatapu really, uh, and they don't have a lot of water, so that's out. Um, coconuts, if you've been into Tonga, you've probably noticed there's a l they, they have a lot of coconuts. Everywhere you look, there's a coconut tree, and the one would think, well, why don't they use biofuel? Only about 10% of uh, coconut actually makes into um, usable fuel. Uh, and the other thing that you have to do is set up a, a, an industry. People to go and collect coconuts, people to process coconuts and turn them into fuel and then supply to the power company. Uh, probably unlikely to happen in a hurry um, and likely to drive cost up. Uh, geothermal is, um, it would be quite nice if you've got geothermal resource, but it, it does require a lot of money before you can actually get that heat um, out of the ground and drive a turbine. Um, and they don't have a lot of that resource in Tongatapu either. Wind is uh, possible, that's 11 kilowatt, that's a 11 kilowatt uh, wind turbine generator uh, in Tonga. It's the only one at the moment and that was put, in, put up as a test case. Um, that uh, is uh, 11 kilowatt um, turbine uh, to give you uh, a sense of appreciation when I wake up in the morning before I come to work. Uh, by the time I've chucked my eggs on, toaster, kettle going, and I'm mining my shirt at the same time, I'm probably getting to 11 kilowatts. Uh, over there, they uh, supply about 23 homes um, with this turbine. Now, these turbines are collapsible, um, so Tonga is prone to cyclones and hurricanes. They do get categories three to five uh, um, cyclones. Um, um, and they get somewhere between 200 and 300 k's uh, per hour of wind. Every time that happens, or when, when you're expecting a wind gust, then you have to deploy your team out there, uh, and they have to go to every single one of these sites and manually collapse them down. Probably, again, not so, not so practical. Um, so solar is a really nice option, and um, Alan's graph showed that uh, production went up after 2008. The other thing that was happening was all of these countries in the Pacific Islands, uh, they wanted to reduce their vulnerability um, to oil price shocks. So they came up with national energy plans, national renewable energy plans, uh, and it just so happened that solar was attractive and economical, so um, a lot of uh, interest there. And um, we got involved for the schools project, not the major project, but the small project for um, schools. So um, this was the organisation structure for the project, uh, taxpayers, you guys, and, and uh, us. Uh, we, uh, uh, our tax, uh, in fact, gave, generously gave to uh, Rotary um, and EcoCare who came up with the project proposal, uh, but they actually needed somebody to do the work um, and, and to design it, to uh, purchase equipment, to go over there and to install it. At this time, back in 2012, um, this was the first time a country had experienced solar energy connected into uh, the grid. Um, so there was no local industry set up for it. Um, we had to purchase equipment from around the world uh, and bargain hard um, to get some good prices. Um, uh, we contractors in Tonga, we had some access to them, but um, we had to work alongside them to learn how to install them. Uh, again, wasn't the first time it was being done. Uh, we had to work with the Minister of Education to get to the schools and Tonga Power, who own the system. It's a power company uh, in the island um, that owns the system. Now, that's interesting, not the schools, uh, but the power company. And when we got to Tonga, we had to actually think about that um, quite a lot and negotiate quite a lot to get to that point. If, um, now Alan showed earlier the, the variability of the, um, the solar um, during the day. Um, so if you're a small uh, power network, so during the day, um, at midday, uh, in Tongatapu, their load's about three and a half megawatts. To give you an appreciation, just earlier today, tonight, we had a look on the screen in University of Canterbury, we're drawing three and a half megawatts from the grid. So that's the entire, um, islands uh, power supply right there. They've deployed two and a half megawatts of solar power at the moment, um, roughly two and a half megawatts of solar power uh, on, on Tongatapu. So that's most of your grid. Now if you've got that variability that's going to cause a lot of issues in your system. Um, so what that means is um, instead of having that nice voltage profile that rises or falls like the one that Alan showed, uh, we're going to get spikes. And those spikes in these inverters, um, those spikes will in turn um, blow what we call varistas that are inside this inverter, and that's going to cause a problem. Um, if a school or minister of education owns these systems, they're probably not going to understand that or know it, and be able to replace parts that needs to that need to be replaced. But uh, Tonga Power would, which is why we were so careful. Now, how do you convince a power company? You show up and you say, "Hey, we've got this." You know, we've got a lot of um, solar power that we want to give to schools. C 
can you own it, maintain it, and by the way, lose all of that money that you're currently generating from schools and just be nice about it and give it to schools. It's a pretty hard job. Um, so we had to work through quite a, quite a bit of um, process with Tonga Power and Minister of Education to convince uh, and come up with, a, with an agreement that basically allowed um, Oper uh, schools to own the system, uh, sorry, schools to benefit from these systems, but Tonga Power to be able to sustainably, sustainably operate it and own it. Um, if you've been into Tonga before, just to give you an appreciation, uh, that's the airport. Um, these are the five schools we, we worked, um, worked on. Um, Tupo College, you actually drive past Tupo as you go into Nukalaofa, it's about a 45 minute drive cruising at about 35, 40 k's an hour. Nobody drives fast uh, on Tongatapu. Um, and Nukalaof is over here. Um, uh, so that was the spread. Um, and we spent a lot of time going between Minister of Education, Tonga Power Limited, and uh, the wharf and um, uh, the, the freight companies, because uh, for about a week and a half, actually I think it was two weeks, um, our equipment was on, on the wharf, and they wouldn't let us release it, because they wanted us to pay tax for it, and they actually had to get it to Cabinet to be able to um, approve um, the release of our equipment. Again, it was the first time we had done this, or the island had seen this kind of work. A um, couple of the schools had problems when we landed there. One school um, that was structurally unsound, so we couldn't put our um, equipment on the, um, on, on the school's roof. Uh, they were expecting demolition in a couple of years' time. Um, and another school, the electrical, existing electrical system was a little bit below what we would expect to wire um, things into. So we had to, again, work with the Minister of Education to, to change that. Um, the whole project was a bit of a capability building exercise. Uh, University Canterbury students ourselves, we learnt a lot about um, having to deal through those challenges in a foreign country that you're just not used to and very quickly um, sink or swim sort of scenario. Uh, we had to, we, we developed some leadership capabilities that we wouldn't have um, and some hands-on practical um, experiences that we wouldn't have. The contractors in country were able to use this experience, by the way they got paid for this experience, we didn't, we were volunteers, experience to, um, uh, to set up a business um, model for themselves that they could um, exercise and uh, right through the power company to the government level they were able to come up with police, uh, policies and, um, and pricing arrangements for future installations. So that was quite uh, a nice exercise. The point of doing all of this of course was to try and help schools out and um, this uh, this chart just shows you the blue graphs are generation, blue bars are generation, the amount generated by, um, uh, the amount of energy generated uh, by the panels um, uh, over a period of a month, or daily average for over a period of a month, and the red bars are um, consumption. Um, what this plot really shows is that in some months, you, this, this is just one school out of the five, they're, they're using more energy than um, they're generating, uh, and some days they're generating more um, than some months they're generating more than they're consuming. When they're generating more than they're consuming, they're actually getting paid back by the power company, um, which is quite nice. Um, uh, not f as much as they would save, but they're, they're, pay they're, they're earning money, they're earning credit. When they're um, consuming more, um, they aren't having to pay for that full amount of that electricity bill um, because they're generating. Um, they're still having to pay some, but not just as much as they would have had to. Um, now, the cost of this back in 2012 uh, was about $5 per watt um, for the system. Um, right now, we'd probably expect to pay about $3.50 per watt here in Christchurch um, by the time it's installed in your home. Um, the reason, a couple of reasons why it was more expensive, one was because it was over in the islands. If you've been into Tonga before, you know that a chocolate bar over there is about six bucks and you can buy that over here for about two bucks. Um, and part of that's because it's remote, it's just the cost of working in remote areas um, and the challenges that you have to deal with. And the other reason why that's slightly um, more than what we'd expect today is because prices of solar panels have decreased a bit. Um, University of Canterbury, since that project has had students over in the islands um, every year, um, just about every year. 2013, we had a group of our students go over and um, look at, uh, further look at the effects of new renewable technologies in the, in the grid there. Um, 
their recommendations have since been adopted by Tonga Power, which is quite nice, and they actually managed to obtain some funding to mitigate some of the problems that they would have expected um, as a result of UC students' work. And Maria last year went over to Vanuatu to do some feasibility projects um, in, Van uh, in Vanuatu funded by University of Canterbury, so that's quite nice. And I guess it all kind of comes down to utilising your electrical engineering knowledge to actually make a tangible difference that you can see really quickly um, in the islands and in turn help um, students from our neighbouring um, countries um, be able to go to school every day without interruptions. So, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Shrijan. Uh, and so, I hope that uh, we've been able to tell you just how big the PV industry is in the world and some of what is happening in the world with PV and uh, a bit more about PV solar power in New Zealand, especially the economics and uh, the resource in New Zealand and, uh, and also um, something about solar power in Tonga.